um, studies. Uh, she has an MD from Jeep University. Uh, she's originally from rural northern Nigeria. Her interests, sorry, her research interests include African traditional religions, Abrahamic religions, race, gender, postcolonialism, uh, and enviro environmentalism. She's also a scholar activist. Um, she, uh, she's also a recipient uh, of several awards, including the Rising Star of the Circle of Concerned African Women Delusions. And uh, our second speaker is uh, um, um, Reverend uh, Patrick uh, Feisitan. Um, he has a bachelor in uh, philosophy from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, uh, another degree from Pontifical Urban University from Rome. He has also a master of theology from Catholic Institute of West Africa, uh, a master in uh, biblical studies uh, from uh, Earthworth College, University of London. He has to biblical Hebrew and uh, script, scripture in various institutions and served in various clerical positions for over 27 years. And he is currently a uh, uh, parochial administrator of Our Lady of Regression uh, Church in uh, Credon in London. Uh, also, and then our last speaker will be uh, Professor Beckford is a professor of black theology at Queen's Foundation, is a scholar activist researching uh, the intersection of faith uh, and racial justice in and through diverse media texts. He has written dozens of books which uh, triangulate the fields of theology, cultural studies and politics. He is a BAFTA award winner. BAFTA is it's a, uh, I think a British uh, uh, filming award. If, and so he's a BAFTA award-winning documentary filmmaker. He has written a presented over 20 films for the BBC, Channel 4, and Discover USA. His film explore a range of themes, including political critics of the British Empire, biblical history, and popular culture. Um, um, in, yeah, that's that's about everything, I think. <laughs> it's, it's a lot, the list is very long, so I just want to short it because uh, uh, okay, so thank you so much, and uh, I will pass on to uh, it's over to you now, Augustine. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mukile, uh, for the for the introduction of our guest speakers for today. Uh, we proceed uh, this way. Uh, we start with uh, Yokia. Uh, she's going to start with a presentation for fifteen minutes. And uh, after that, we have uh, uh, Father Patrick have his presentation from the from his African perspective, and uh, and uh, you came from the experience in the U.S. as well as uh, Professor Beckford from the Caribbean perspective, and uh, we address the topic of uh, decolonizing the the curriculum. So at this point, um, uh, you came, you you take the the virtual microphone. Yeah. All right, thank you, Brother Austin. It's a pleasure to be here, everybody. It's a pleasure also to see Dr. Beckford here. I've been following his work for many years, especially during the time when he had dreadlocks. So I never mentioned it to, this, to the network, but I'm a big fan of Dr. Beckford. I used to talk about him every time. And I'm also, it's a pleasure to be here with, with Father Patrick. Um, so I'll be doing my presentation now. And thank you all for being here. I know it's very early in some parts of the world. It's thank you for taking the time to be here on Saturday uh, morning. Uh, okay, so I call my presentation today, Freeing the Spirits. This is how Africa liberated, you know, Christianity. I can't see, let me hold on please. So I say freeing the spirits, how indigenous African religions liberated Christianity. Um, I want you to look at closely to these pictures. These pictures are very important. This is from the Aladura church uh, that was founded in Nigeria in the, um, um, 19, around the 1950s. Um, so can we go next please? So this is the roadmap. I will go, with, I'll go swiftly actually, since I have only 15 minutes. Uh, Africa before Christianity, and you have, you've seen all of that. So I will go with, um, well, 
yeah, so the roadmap is Africa before Christianity, early Christianity in Africa. So I'll go to the first to, this, uh, to the fourth century, Christianity and theology. So 15th century. So this is where this is going to be my uh, focus because this is the Christianity that is dominant in Africa today. And then how indigenous African religions liberated Christianity. And then Igbeso, it means it's finished. So, and then we'll go to the, for the discussions. But Austin, could you go next? Okay. Okay, so Africa before Christianity. So what what did so what do what did Africans believe before Christianity? So of course Africans knew God thousands of years before Christianity and even Islam. But today we're going to focus specifically on Christianity, and then they believed in um, so this these religions are called different things: Jupe, um, uh, Vundun. If uh, I can't see the slide, brother Austin. Okay. Um, I can you see that? I can't see it. Okay. There you go. Yeah. So Jew, Buri, Ifa, Vundun in Ghana and, and Benin and Togo, Siri in Senegal and Gambia and Zimbabwe, Chi, Vangu. Okay, so the common features of these religions um, in Africa, they are all over Africa. They're unique to et this, the ethnic groups, but they're also, um, they have, the, there are also lots of features that are similar with all of these religions all over this continent. Okay, so you have your personal uh, shrine to the day, to a specific deity that is special to you. And then you have um, the personal shrine and God in your home, but you also have a diviner so for Christians, we'll be going to a pastor that you can talk to. But you also, you know, you've, you have this particular deity that you, you venerate very much because this particular deity, you, you know, is very special to you and takes care of you. And then you also have ancestors on this shrine that you, you venerate. So these ancestors are sometimes are family members and sometimes they are distant family members, especially for those in the diaspora. So the physical and the spiritual are, are interconnected. This is to say that what you, the, your belief it's not just about your spirituality. It's not just about praying to God, but it's also connected to the earth. So meaning the land, the ground, dirt is very important. Water is very important. Um, the, uh, the sky, the air you breathe. So everything, they're all interconnected. So when you're sick, for example, it's not just, oh my God, my body is sick. It's, it, it, it relates to everything around you. So the understanding, so when you go to a diviner, you say, I'm sick. The diviner will say, who did you wrong? So we're gonna be, so the people around you, right? This, your, the, your, your, phys, your body, but also the people around you and the spirits, because now you're gonna consult the spirits, the ancestors and the gods. Yeah. So you have also male and female deities. These male and female deities that you venerate and um, some of them are also, um, uh, and also ancestors, some of them are also family members. And then spirit possession, this is also a part of the future of this religion. Um, you're possessed by a spirit. So if an ancestor wants to speak to you, this particular ancestor will possess your body. So your body then becomes the body of that ancestor's temporary. So you move a certain way, okay? When, the, when this uh, ancestor possess you, sometimes animals possess you. So you start moving like a snake, you know, so to, to deliver a message. So blood sacrifice is also important here. Um, some you sacrifice, and I mean by blood sacrifice, you sacrifice animals, but um, in some ethnic groups, you know, human sacrifice was also performed. Um, music is very important in this because, for example, he beating the drum, because the drum communicates, uh, uh, it communicates uh, not just uh, calling the spirits, but it's also pleasing them. But it's also, the drum is also important because it, it, uh, it, it, uh, it's, a, it, it's also a warning. It use, it's being used for warning. So I grew up in the village. So some of these things for me, I grew up in the village in, in rural Northern Nigeria. So some of these things are very personal to me. I've experienced some of them. And then healing is also important. As I mentioned about how healing is not just about physical, but it's also spiritual. Um, so these are the, uh, the features of this religion. I just wanted to go through it uh, swiftly, but it's important for us to know that prior to Christianity, Africa's new God, okay? Brother Austin. And then this just goes swiftly also. Uh, so Christianity was in Africa in the first, in the early uh, century. So when Christianity was becoming a religion, 
Uh, so it, when it was becoming a religion, it was in Africa. So if you look at the Bible, some, some scholars might say we cannot use the Bible as a historical book, but there are pieces of this Bible that we cannot ignore because they appear also in secular history. So Christianity was in Africa very early on. So if you read the Bible, when Jesus and his family were under persecution by King Herod, when, when he heard of this new king of the Jews. So he was on a hunt, right, to kill this baby. And then Jesus and his family um, were on hijra, that is to say they travel on hijra, their own hijra, right, the Christian um, hijra. So his, Jesus and his family were in Egypt to seek for safety. And then I just wanted to point out also that the first early university in the world, right, was started by, by Africans, according to, uh, to some notable scholars. And this is in Alexandria. So if you look at the picture on the bottom, on the bottom is on my left, the gray picture, black and white picture. That is a hall in, in Alexandria. That's a, the hall where they, you know, of, of learning. So like, you know, like one of the halls you may have in these days, you know, you go for, for lectures, it's a lecture hall. And then the picture actually on my right, that is picture of baby Jesus as depicted by early Christians in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is very important in the history of Christianity. So Ethiopia, Egypt, uh, Nubia, Kush, which is present in Sudan. And so, the, so you look at the picture in the middle, that's in Sudan. Those are some of the, well, some of the most, we have many pyramids. We don't usually hear about them, but they're in Kush, just present day Sudan. And those are, these are, uh, this is a picture of, uh, of, of that. So ecumenalism, so where church leaders would gather, we hear about that, how church leaders would gather and, 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 um, and decide on a theology. Let's say whether Jesus is, whether Mary is divine because she's the mother of Christ or whether even Jesus is truly divine and, and whether he was just man and not God, whether he's man and God or the Trinity, you probably heard of that. But, so with all of that, the debate, this is our Africans were the first to start this. So you, some of us probably heard of the Council of Nicaea, but actually prior to the Council of Nicaea, Africans were already debating serious issues. So the Council of Castledon, okay. So they were debating issues about the, the divinity of Christ. But some of this we do not know because our history of Christianity is heavily Eurocentric. Uh, so, and, and lastly on this, on this part, I just wanted to make a point is, uh, the term Pope was an African that, that said it, but today we often hear it from Vatican in Italy, okay? But uh, Afri so Africans contribu contributed heavily in theology. Even when we speak of systematic theology, um, Africans were their origin, um, Augustine. So all of these uh, men and women actually participated in shaping early Christianity. Um, so these are, I just wanted to make, uh, to make that, uh, to give us that context, okay? So Christianity was already in Africa prior to this version of Christianity that I want to highlight, okay? Lord Augustine, please, next. And then, let me see. So this is a ver the version of Christianity that we have that is very dominant in Africa today is the 15th century Christianity that came via Jesuit missionaries. So they were in places like Congo, they were places like um, Ethiopia. For example, one of, the, uh, one of the prominent Christian women that we have, Walata Petras, she was an Ethiopian woman who was also an organizer. Okay. She, uh, she organized a group of, of, of women, organization, she, she, she organized a group of women who were resisting Portuguese version of Christianity because they brought this Christianity, this Catholicism, and prior, right? Ethiopia already had Christianity, which is known as Orthodox Christianity. And they were practicing this, and then the Jesuits were trying to impose the, the version of Christianity. And these women, Walata Petras and her community of women, resisted. Hence the reason why, up to today, we have uh, Ethiopian Orthodox as the main. Christian uh, uh, religion uh, 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 denomination or Christian, uh, yeah, in, 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 um, in Ethiopia. Then we have other Europeans, they follow later on, you know, so, so within, we can, such as the Catholic, I mean, the, pardon me, Methodists, Anglicans, and, and all of those groups, they started coming later on, okay. 
And then, so what they did when these Europeans came to these different places in Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, sending, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and other places on the continent, they started bringing, they brought with them their own version of Christianity. So their own reading of the Bible. So they read the Bible and they came with it with, but of course, they, because theology, as we know it, it also comes from your experience. You read theology based off of you, how you see the world. So they came with their own baggage of what they believe Christianity ought to be. So when they presented it to Africans, they presented it as, oh, indigenous African religions are bad. So they're labeled now pagans, cults. So you often hear even among Africans, they will say, oh, that, this person is practicing fetish. It's fetishism, fetishism. And then the Bible, when it was translated into the local language, what they did was they used the language of, so the deities, remember early on when I did the introduction, African deities are translated as demons and devils. An example to this would be, for example, even when I'm a big fan of Nigerian movies, I watch Nigerian movies to, you know, depress, you know, to, to calm down, <laughs> to have a moment. So, and I watch a lot of Yoruba movies, so I understand a little bit of Yoruba. So there's the word, the Eshu, Eshu is a deity, in 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 the, in Euro, in 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 in, the, in Ifa. So Eshu, this Eshu has many qualities. Eshu is how I see Eshu. I describe Eshu as a as like Jesus. Eshu because Eshu can bless and Eshu can curse, and he's one of the most venerated venerated deities within the Ifa traditional religion. Yet it, when when Africans, well, I will speak most specifically. There's this Nigerian movie where they describe Eshu as the devil. And then they put him against Jesus. Those sort of stuff, it's been done because of how we have been, in, we've been uh, taught to see African traditional religions. To, uh, so drumming also is another thing that was not permitted by missionaries in, in mission founded churches uh, because they believe that mission is, uh, mission is, it's uh, because they believe the drum, you know, because it's calling, the, it's, it's, a, it's used for pagan worship, so we don't want it. And then the other part is the icons in the church. So within the Catholic church, you see all the icons are usually uh, a pale skin, you know, white people, you know. So they brought this icon into Africa and they expect Africans to, to, to venerate those, um, those uh, to, venerate, to venerate them. Uh, so because for the, for the interest of time, I'm gonna continue to go swiftly. Uh, so this is how this is this is the concluding part of my presentation. How Africans liberated Christianity. So they responded. Africans responded to Europeans' imposition of their own theology. They said this is not how we want to worship. So Africans understand religion based off of their own culture and their own understanding of the world. Because then they are theolo theologizing. Hymenote, as we say in Ge'ez, their hymenote their hymen note is based off of their experience. So women, they have started having women in leadership because prior, what the other thing the Europeans did was they said, we don't want women in leadership, even though when they arrived, Africans were already having women speaking up. So they said, we don't want that, they're too loose. So they imp imp imposed imp impose Victorian version of cultural arrangement. And then we have earth keeping, the earth is special to African traditional religion. So earth keeping also being important within the African independent churches. So you don't just, dis, just build a church just because now all of a sudden you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And, this, and then you know, filled by the uh, spirit, spirit possession, which is, uh, you know, you, 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 you are, now they, they call it uh, 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 spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit within the Christian context. And then the icons, I have to mention this real quick. The icons um, in Kimpavita, this is in Congo. Kimpa Vita was one of the African women who is credited by some scholars as the mother of African independent churches because she resisted a uh, uh, Portuguese version of Christianity that they, in, that, that they brought all the icons where white people. She said, this is not what I, this is not my reading of the Bible. So she replaced them all with black faces. And, of, and, then, and then in response, they, they um in response the uh they they burn her at a stake meaning they, they you know they they lynch her pretty much and then the the uh, polygamy so africans were reading the bible through uh through the uh the old testament they, so when europeans came they said one man one woman and africans said that our culture you can marry more than one wife and we see that in the bible so we're going to do that 
I know someone that's even in, in this in, in African independent churches, she's right now interested in being in a polygamous marriage. She's Christian. So the liturgy is now lively, you know, and also libations. The Catholic churches where they pour libations to the ancestors. This is something that Europeans, uh, Europeans uh, discourage, but now Africans are doing it. Thank you for your time and I look forward to our discussion. Okay, thank you so much, uh, um, Jürgen Yam, for this wonderful talk. And uh, so I think our, our next speaker will be a uh, reverend. And um, uh, reverend, your microphone is yours. Just thank minute. you very much. Just a minute, I'll, be, I'll put up your slides further. Okay. I can't talk without the slides, I guess. Okay. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I want to begin by thanking the organizers, the African Research Network, for inviting me to participate in this very important uh, discussion. Uh, I have listened to Yoknam, and I, I like the, the path that she has taken. Uh, I won't want to repeat some of the things she has said, but basically, I'd like to start by uh, putting things in perspective. I don't want to underestimate the wideness of the scope of this topic for our discussion. And so I have decided to focus attention on the key concepts embedded in the topic, uh, decolonization, theology, enculturation, and spirituality. I shall also limit the perspective of this discussion to the Yoruba speaking people of West Africa, from which I shall make pertinent highlights of theological uh, enculturation issues relating to our topic of discussion. Uh, I shall propose at the end of my contribution possible ways and means of attaining an authentic spirituality as Africans. Uh, I want to situate this discussion within the current framework of events in our world, uh, particularly the highlights and importance that is so attached to abuse, uh, that is sexual abuse of people, abuse of power, abuse of authority, and the aftermath of all that. Uh, one of the important discussions going on around the world at this moment is uh, how the church has failed in its efforts to bring Christ to people. You know, priests have molested people, uh, bishops and priests and cardinals have been set up and they have fallen headlong into, uh, you know, this evil of abuse. We are all witnesses to the way and manner that these issues are highlighted in the media, but, if we pay so much attention to, you know, bringing about restitution, uh, doing things right, punishing the offenders, and we fail to see that what took place at the Berlin Conference of 1884 was in itself a rape of a people, a rape of a whole continent. Africans were living their lives so very organized in very many ways. I remember in Nigeria, the last of the kingdoms to give way was the Egba kingdom. And they gave way to the colonialists. Just at the eve of the amalgamation of Nigeria, the Northern and the Southern protectorates in 1914. This Egba kingdom had fought wars, has organized social setting, a promotion of justice, trade and commerce, and it was a very effective society. But when the class came and together hand in hand with the missionaries, you know, this is the way uh, they all went about doing their things, missionaries and colonizers in some kind of a bilateral arrangement. You know, one is bringing the gospel, the other is bringing what are they bringing, really? What did they bring? They were rather ready to take from us, ready to take everything that we had, our lives, 
our consciousness as a people, our religion, our mode of worship, our culture, our, our justice patterns, even our politics, just to give to us their own version of democracy. This is a rape of a people. And this is what the colonization aims at, you know, correcting, bringing about a new focus so people see themselves as an authentic people created in the image and likeness of God, given all that they need in order that they may make something out of life itself. When we talk about decolonization and theology, uh, decolonization, I'll say, is the process by which colonized countries or regions gain independence from their colonizers. This is a process that set in motion with the advent of nationalism, the consciousness of people in their struggle to tell the oppressors, the colonizers, that we realize you took something away from us. We need our liberty. We need our independence. And we want to create a just society, not according to your own dictates and your own canons, but according to our own interpretation of our relationship with God and our relationship with one another in a civilized society. When the colonization is applied to theology, I like to define theology in the commonest way, faith-seeking understanding, the colonization seeks to right the wrong claims of the European missionary to monopoly of authentic faith and relationship with God. Christian missionaries have coerced people into seeing their cultures, faith, and values as inferior to the ones listed on the European Value Exchange Program. That's what I call colonization in my own way. European Value Exchange Program. This is the way colonizers also condemned the already organized systems of government and administration of society in the 19th century. The synergy between colonization and Christian missionary enterprise is what the colonization seeks to uproot from the consciousness of liberated Christians who have been sold the dummy of Europeanized faith, liturgy, spirituality, and who have lived with such myopic understanding, which made them look down on, squash, and throw away the rich values that are embedded in the African prior to the colonial invasion. African religions and cultures have been labeled as heathenism and evil. Their education as inferior. In fact, centuries before the missionary and political incursion into Africa, it was argued whether black people could be brought to salvation and be baptized, since it was something debatable whether they had a rational soul. In 1596, Queen Elizabeth I had declared that the black Moors of Northern Africa have no understanding of Christ or of his gospel. Current trigger points for efforts in the colonizing is the pervading racial discrimination towards people of color and the echoes of the Black Lives Matter movement and campaigns around the Western world. We are all witnesses to all that has happened in the last year, I'm not talking about the pandemic, talking rather about the American 2020 reality, issues of elections covered with issues of racism, religious bias, and, and so on and so forth. Even here in Europe and in the UK, Black Lives Matter versus white supremacist agenda also came to the fore. I remember sometime towards the middle and I think about August, September, when the protests began concerning slave trade and those who participated in slave trade, Unfortunately, so one of the icons I grew to cherish and to adore, the Lord Baden Powell, founder of the Boy Scouts. His matter came up as one who cooperated with the evils of racism. So unfortunate. So, how can theology be done in such an atmosphere 
where there is lack of respect for the dignity of the human person, the care of God's creation, is it the same understanding that our beliefs are taken in the name of Christianity? Does a people possess monopoly of knowledge of and appreciation of God? Is Christianity as we know it today a European fashion? What role does the culture of a people play in the understanding of God? Has colonization done more harm than good to the consciousness of the colonized? And has the effect of colonization made Africa richer or immensely enriched the colonizers? I'm sure you are providing answers to some of this already as I speak. How can theology set the mind of the enslaved and the abused free in the contemporary world where globalization has become the key word? And talking about globalization, I think it's one of the agendas of Christianity. In Matthew chapter 28, even our Lord Jesus said, go into all the world. And missionaries were quick to stand on that and to bring us the brand of religion that has been Europeanized, even as they took something away from us that we ought to have lived to cherish and perhaps even sell to the whole of the world. Uh, Inculturation represents the specifically religious or theological reassertion of the African memory, an offshoot of the post-colonial discourse, and an experience seeking to develop the African identity. Just as in politics and post-colonial struggle, inculturation theology seeks to make sense of how the current global political and cultural situation can be understood and affirmed, how God can be known by an African in an African way without losing the ideals that already is built up in the consciousness of that African. Yoknam was talking about Eshu. Yes, Eshu, in Yoruba traditional religion and worship, is God of justice. But those who first translated the Bible, you know, just put one for the other. Eshu is translated to be Satan. What an unfortunate thing that happened. That those of us who grew up, you know, in the post-colonial era, just understood that Eshu is evil. It's the devil and nothing more. But knowing better now that the issue that is called the devil is not so called in the African traditional way. Yoruba don't believe in the issue as uh, the devil, which is promoted by the holy book of us Christians. By the time the Second Vatican Council was convoked by Pope John the Twenty Third, the matters of post-colonial emancipation and decolonization was, you know, getting to the fore. And I think the council richly addressed some matters that became of benefit to Africans who are Catholics, who are Christians, even side by side, uh, making appeal to other religions and other non-Catholic Christian faith and practices. I remember in the opening address of Pope John the Twenty-Third uh, to the bishops of the world, I think about sixty-one of those. Over 2,000 bishops were Africans. The Pope actually, in his address before the council, which was broadcast, talked about the fact that this is the first time in history that the fathers at the council will truly come from all the nations of the world. And in opening the council, he insisted on the fundamental equality of peoples, urged that we refute racism, European colonial domination, as well as making a call for the church to truly be a church of the poor, some kind of a fundamental option for the poor. Adrian Hastings reminisces on the Vatican Council, and he comes up with this quotation that I am in love with. He says, the conciliar themes of localization and pluralism, of the recognition of the positive values of different cultures, even other religious traditions, the new use of the vernacular in the liturgy, 
ecumenical rapprochement, all this conformed with the general early 1960s stress on African political and cultural values, on decolonization, on the necessity of cooperation and unity across the divisions of tribe, race, and religion. I was born into the era of implementation of the Second Vatican Council. And sadly to say that as rich as the council came up with matters that could have helped Catholicism in Africa to really develop itself and take its pride of place in, in the church, uh, still clerics, theologians exist who are in opposition to some of the recommendations of the council. I'm happy to know that my father was one of the early composers of Yoruba liturgical hymns approved for use in the local church. His progenitors had converted into Christianity from Yoruba religion. Their first love had been the African church from where my father moved on to becoming not just a Catholic, but a teacher of religion and catechist. Most of his compositions reflect mode of singing and worship in the traditional Yoruba religion, which is usually a call and response formula. He also took into his composition the tonal and melodical structure of Yoruba worship song. He was not alone in this regard. Most of the composers relying on the rudiments of Christian theology already passed on to them through Catholic schools and westernized uh, catechesis enrich the liturgy in their own way with hymns that speak to the spontaneity of the African person, accompanied, of course, by local musical instruments, Yailu, Gogo, Agogo, Shekere, Samba, Akuba, instruments which until the late 1960s were an anathema to church liturgy. Let me note here, sadly, that as late as the year 2004, I know an African prelate who will not allow the use of drums in his cathedral, but would gladly, you know, enjoy the celebration of mass in Latin every Sunday, even when the people really didn't know what words were being said and what was the interpretation of those texts. Uh, communion of saints, an element of Christian faith which can easily find resonance with the Yoruba culture is the belief in the immortality of the soul and by extension, the communion of saints. The colonizers brought to us names of their own faith ancestors. And to a large extent, they made us throw away the rich values inherent in the names we bear as Yoruba people. I make bold to say that there is no Yoruba name without a meaning, rich meaning at that. In fact, names are given to babies based on family history, faith alliance, circumstance, or celebration of life. Most of the names we bear qualify for use at baptism and confirmation. When a candidate is asked to choose a new name as a sign of the newness of life he or she is taking on without prejudice to the cult of the saints and the attendant solicitude attached to bearing the names of saints, there is a need for promotion of cultural values which are in line with the spirit of the gospel. A young man I had given tremendous help to in the past once gave all my names to his first child as a sign of gratitude to God for the gift of Father Patrick. He told me he baptized his child and he gave the names Patrick Adeoluwa Feishito, including my surname. Feishito means, anyway, make this a story. Adeoluwa oh, sorry, means the sorry, of the sorry, Lord. sorry, Reverend. If you like to please uh, making, start making your closing arguments because of time. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let, let me quickly talk about, uh, well, I've talked about baptism. Uh, you see, I, I call for some kind of a fusion of the Christian naming ceremony and the celebration of baptism because they bring the same thing. They bring children to society and bring children to the society of the church. Uh, 
masquerade. Masquerade festival is very common and popular among the Yorubas. It celebrates the ancestors. And in Yoruba traditional religion, ancestors were good people who had lived and left signs for us to emulate. Uh, authentic spirituality is what I'll talk about rather than talk about black spirituality. Uh, reason being that uh, I believe that if you are resisting something, you don't go to the extreme that is going to create something that is going to be, you know, making you become guilty of the same thing that you are complaining about. So I talk about authentic spirituality. My spirituality is how I am able to relate with God in the core of my being and also relate with the universe and all that is in it. So putting my cultural values together, I'm able to approach God and then relate with him in my own way, of course, according to what I have grown up to know and which I have been taught. And then I'm able to make something out of this for myself and for the promotion of the goodness of humanity. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks so thank you very much, Reverend. Uh, that was very interesting. Uh, just to recap a little bit, so Yokiam uh, was his first speaker. She talked about, uh, uh, she mentioned that the fact that Christian was there in Africa before, so it was there well before. Um, uh, and then at some point around the 15th century, we had the European bringing another version of, uh, of Christianity. And, uh, and um, Reverend uh, Patrick also talked about the, the brand of Christianity that was uh, Europeanized. And, um, and in, it took to, with reference, with reference to Yoruba culture. So now we're going to hear from Professor Beckford, who is going to talk about the Caribbean perspective. Professor, over to you. Uh, could you please unmute yourself? There we go, I'm unmuted. I'm just going to pull up my presentation. There we go. If you just bear with me for two minutes, I'll just pull this up. There we go. And let me just get this from the, from the start. Pleasure to be with you. I think there's points of connection with my presentation and the two previous ones, but I want to talk about decoloniality. Um, the work of Walter Walt Mignolo and obviously the Latin American decolonial theorists using that to foreground our thinking about the black church and gospel music in particular. Now, as we go along, I'll explain why I think gospel music and musicality is important for thinking about decoloniality. Um, look, my context, just in case you're not aware of it, I'm African Caribbean, I'm part of the African Caribbean diaspora in Britain. Um, my, my parents came to Britain in the post-war years as colonial citizens, colonized by the British, enslaved by the British from the uh, uh, 6th, 17th to the 19th century, um, when they, that, after which they got uh, independence, political independence, but not economic independence. You know how the story goes. Um, but my Christianity is part of the Black Atlantic experience. You're familiar with Paul, Work, Paul Gilroy's uh, epoch-making book, The Black Atlantic. The Black Atlantic is a space between the Caribbean, North America, and Europe, which is marked by an interchange of ideas a crisscrossing of theological ideas from the Caribbean to America to Britain. Think of Marcus Garvey. Think of the way in which Pentecostalism spread um, from LA uh, to the Caribbean, to Britain. It's part of an interchange, that, an exchange, which we're still doing today. Uh, we're an example of it right now, this crisscross of ideas. Um, but uh, my tradition is also influenced by African retentions, uh, the memory of Africa. Uh, in Jamaica, for example, there are African retentive, retentive religions such as Mayal, Obia, um, it, Malobe complex, um, Pokumina. If you go to other parts of the Caribbean, Santeria, Vudon, all echoes of the African past of my Christian tradition although it's part of the Black Atlantic, is still formed by the African past as well. And I'm interested in theomusicality. The, again, the way that Black sacred music works as a form of theopraxis, the articulation of theology in and through music, and why that is important for thinking about decoloniality. Why? Because Black Pentecostals in Britain, it might be true in North America as well, sing more songs about God than they hear sermons. Listen to more songs about God then they hear sermons, listen to more songs, sing more songs, then they read books about theology. Therefore, most of the theological material and ideas that Black Pentecostal Christians engage with is coming from the music. So we've got to think about 
what's happening within the music. And when you start listening to the music and analysing it theologically, you, you see it's quite colonial in terms of the categories uh, that people are using to think about. Well, we'll think about. We'll get onto that in a minute. Um, I'm interested then in the colonial matrix of power as a way of thinking about colonization. But I don't see this as something which is completely new in the work of Mignola. I, I would argue, I argue in my work that Rastafari reached a similar conclusion 70 years before Mignola, where they understood that the Babylon system, remember Bob Marley sings about the Babylon system, Babylon system as a vampire, sucking the blood of the sufferers, talking about the economic exploitation within the capitalist system. And then he goes on to say that they're building churches and universities, deceiving the people continually. He said, Bob Marley, yeah, never read any deep uh, colonial uh, literature, never read any stuff by Mignola, uh, never read any Marxism, but completely understood how a colonial system worked at the economic and ideological level to, to uh, strip people of their assets, but also confuse them intellectually. So I believe that when we're talking about decolonization, decoloniality, we can look back within our own histories, our own cultures, our own theologies, and find echoes of this kind of thinking and, and I argue that we, we find that within, within Rastafari. And Rastafari is useful to work with, again, because their theologizing is explored in music. You see, there's a connection here between the decolonization, the coloniality and the musicality, all kind of linked together here in terms of how we go about challenging the coloniality. So, so both Rastafari and de the decoloniality of Mignola deal with the, continu the, the continuity of coloniality, specifically racial capitalism and epistemic um, oppression. Uh, uh, so yeah, I'm trying to just hint at the fact there that this is not new that we're hearing from, from Mignola. So when I talk about colonial Christianity and the coloniality of Christianity, we go back into Caribbean history and we look at some of the things that were said to enslaved people. And uh, one of the um, important uh, pieces of history for me is the early 18th century when the Moravian church gets to the Caribbean and the head of the Moravian church, Ludwig von Zinzendorf, preaches in Jamaica in the uh, 1720s. And this is what he says to the enslaved people. This was obviously before they knew about prosperity doctrine. We had to preach to keep people happy. You know, this is um, old fashioned priest. What he says to them, he says to these enslaved people, quote, be true to your husbands and wives and obedient to your masters and bombers, overlords. The Lord has made all ranks, kings, masters, servants and slaves. God has punished the first Negroes by making them slaves and your conversion will make you free, not from the control of your masters, but simply from your wicked habits and all that makes you unhappy with your lot. Unquote. Now, obviously, he wasn't expecting to get a big offering at the end of this, because it's not the kind of thing you preach. You want people to feel good about themselves and feel like they want to, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, put some money in the offering plate. Three things that come out of this that register the coloniality of Christianity. First, the soteriology. It is folded into racial hi hierarchy and, and Christian biopolitics. It's all about the body. What does it mean to be saved? Stay true to the racial hierarchy. Don't rock the boat. And also, your faith is just about your body, not about the social world. You see, the soteriology here is all about you, the individual. God will make, you know, your conversion will make you free, not from the control, control of your masters. Your conversion has nothing to do with the social world and politics. It's all about biopolitics or piety or the puritanism in the North American context. That was part of the corruption of colonial Christianity, whether in the Caribbean, whether in West Africa, Central Africa, it taught us a corrupt soteriology where salvation was only concerned with individualism and personal piety. You see, so decolonizing it, you see, well, the, direction, the direction we're going in, we're decolonizing it, we're looking at a more holistic approach to soteriology. Second thing that ha is happening here in terms of colonial Christianity is a white supremacist hermeneutic, interpreting the biblical text through whiteness. And what happens here is Zinzendorf, evokes the curse of Ham in Genesis as legitimation for black subordination. We know that's a corruption of the text. That's not that it wasn't Ham who's cursed, it's Canaan who's cursed. And in the ancient world, the text wasn't meant to mean that one group was subordinate to another group in perpetuity. That isn't what the text is about, but he uses that to legit, so the hermeneutic here. And again, you see, if we're gonna decolonize Christianity, we've got to look at biblical interpretation. 
I'm going to ask the question about who's interpreting tools are we using? If Laundry Lord is correct, the master's tools, cannot dismantle the master's house. There's uh, what African scholars called uh, epistemicide. We can destroy our ways of knowing by negating them. So we foreground our ways of knowing, our hermeneutic. That's part of the decolonizing process. And, and, and finally here, your wicked habits. This is what an attack on African being, African history. Afrophobia is what we call it in the Caribbean. Mission, colonial Christianity taught us to hate everything about our Africanness, fear it. It's all part of the colonial Christian me mechanism of control. So you become more Christian when you become less black. You become more Christian when you become less African. That was part of the, the mechanism of control. And isn't it tragic? 400 years on, we're still struggling with that. Am I too black to be in the ministry in this denomination? Am I, am I too African? Is my accent not right? That was all part of the missionary system of control. Take the Africanness out of them and you can control them. It's one of the reasons why many of us had to change our names. We can't re reclaim our, ne our African name. We reclaim our African heritage. I'm actually making a documentary film about that. That's why I haven't changed mine yet. You see, I'm waiting for the, uh, it to come out in the, in the film. Uh, let's just press on here uh, and I'll be as quickly as I can. So how do we then decolonize? Well, in decolonial theory, you go to the borderlands because it's in borderland thinking where there is the connection between the outside world and the inside world. It's a creative space, not just a geographical border, but an epistemic border, a hermeneutical border. I go to the work of the former rap gospel artist, Jahazel. He was a famous rap Christian artist from 2000 to 2015. 2015, he renounced his faith. The last thing he did when he was in the Christian tradition was, was speak why he's leaving the Christian tradition. I thought it was quite interesting because everything that he speaks about registers the decolonization of the tradition. It's almost the opposite or in, or in, or in diametric opposition to what coloniality did. So he says, look, quote, now after 20 years of being vocal about the positives of the Christian faith, I would like to take some time to be equally vocal about the negatives I've found. Christianity and its controlling dictatorship, its historic blood trail, its plagiarized Bible stories, characters, and concepts, the many human errors of the Bible and its contradictions, the brutal nature of its God, its involvement in the slave trade, the Crusades, the Inquisition, the witch hunts, its second class view of women, its masculinization of God, its emasculation of men, its financial corruption, you get my drift, unquote. Uh, and he left the Christian faith. So this is just at the border. This is just before he kind of had said, I'm no longer going to be a Christian. And he produces his first non-Christian single, which is all about African religion. Amin Ra. Moves to the border of Christianity, engaged in African religion. So I said, hold on, there's something quite fascinating here. Let, let's pause his leaving statement and his last single for ideas about how we can decolonize the faith. What in decolonial theory they call decolonial options. What does he give us? Well, he gives us a womanist soteriology. He acknowledges that Sal, the, the, the colonial tradition not only discriminates against men, but women in particular. So I pass from his work, a, a womanist soteriology, the old idea that that sotology, the doctrine of salvation, practice of salvation has to be holistic. It is about individuals and groups. It's about the spiritual and the material. It's about the social and the political. You cannot separate them. A very kind of holistic African approach to soteriology. The second is a co-contextual hermeneutic. He recognizes that the biblical text has been interpreted by white people for white pe people racialized as white. And therefore we need to co-contextualize it, taking our blackness seriously as we co-contextualize and engage with the biblical text. And thirdly, there's a celebration of black historiography, black history, rather than Afrophobia, loving blackness is what he articulates in the song. And also I parse that as well from, from a more broader analysis of his leaving statement. You see, so Jahazel gives us the resources then for decolonizing Christianity and gospel music. And again, do you see the music theme? It's the musicians who are doing some of this creative work. What I have to do though is develop a production technique. How do we then turn this decolonial theory into a production technique for producing music? Because my ambition here is to actually produce and make gospel music, you see, to, to tell how it can be decolonized. I go to what's called the West Indian front room. This is how my parents decorated their house back in the 1970s. It was all, it was an, it was a, an exercise in signification. Everything they put in the front room was a celebration of their diasporic experience. Things didn't have to match. Match. This was before feng shui. This is, this is black people feng shui. 
So everything gets packed in there. Everything is symbolic. And in our house, the most important um, uh, uh, item was the stereogram where we played the music, you see? Now what's significant about this room in terms of spirituality is that on Saturday night, it could be used for parties. Then on Sunday night, it became a place, Sunday morning, it became a place of prayer, prayer. See the double consciousness of the room. When my father played music in the stereogram, he would play, he, this, this is before his Christian days, he'd play Christian music, then secular music. Christian music, then secular music. This holistic cosmology, you see, this soteriology uh, was, was being played out in his music selection. So he could play a song about racism and then play a song about a loving God. Play a song about suffering of the poor and then play a song about a God of deliverance. And that created in my consciousness this idea that salvation in lyricism could be holistic. So I take that practice and produce it in a, and, and, and develop it into production technique. The result of this is an album that I produced a few years ago called the Jamaican Bible Remix. It is a decolonized gospel album. So it takes these three themes, woman is soteriology, co-contextual hermeneutics, and a, a black historiography, loving blackness, and etches these themes into gospel music production. I'm gonna play you one of the songs to end with as an example of this. This song is called Incarnation. No blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Let's explain the title to you. Obviously, you know about the, the message of the incarnation. God becomes flesh in John 1. The incarnation, according to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is also about social justice. If God's spirit resides in all flesh, all human beings are equal. Remember, Bonhoeffer spends time in America. So when he goes back to Germany, he's got these questions of racial justice in the background. And if you, if you sift through what Bonhoeffer is writing about, you can see how spending time in Harlem influences thinking around equality. Incarnation is about equality. When my parents came here, in the post-war years, they were met with signs in the windows of houses that said, no blacks, no Irish, and no dogs. You, want, you aren't wanted here. So what I decided to do with this song is, is juxtapose these two ideas in the lyricism. So the lyricism tells the story of that experience of coming to Britain and experiencing discrimination, but I juxtapose it with the incarnation at the beginning and the end. Well, the incarnation is about equality, what about what did our parents experience from these people, including the Christian people? It wasn't this. How, how do we resolve this, this tension that they experienced? And I try and resolve it in the end through a, a importing a chorus from the black church tradition uh, to show how black people try to resolve this tension in their experience. The visual, though, is about the contemporary struggle over black flesh and black flesh being seen as equal. It is a collage of images and narratives of all of, of some of the 300 or so black people have been killed in police custody since the 1970s. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna play this to, to end, end with. In 1954, about 10,000 West Indians came to Britain. In 1955, it is believed another 15,000 will make the long journey. Already their coming has caused a national controversy, but one point must always be borne in mind. Whatever our feelings, we cannot deny the mention. For all are British citizens, and as such, are entitled to the identical rights of any member of the Empire. John uh, chapter 1 No, the one where the world Ton man Him come con live monks we Con live monks we No, the one where the world Ton man Him come con live monks we John 1.14 tells the story of Jesus' incarnation That the word becomes flesh and lives amongst us it means that God, who is fully God and fully man, takes on human form. The incarnation means that unequivocally all creation is good and that all flesh, no matter what colour, no matter what tone, is good. My parents believed in this meaning of the incarnation, that their flesh was good. They were immigrants from Jamaica who came to work in Britain after the Second World War. But they soon came to realise that not everybody thought the same. When they went to look for places to live, they were greeted with signs that said No blacks, no Irish and no dogs. Still five thousand miles with the sun way off behind me. The 
said it's gonna be a while Till I feel that warm again Staring at the gray skies As the cold wind starts to soak me Faces that I recognize But no one I call a friend Just one place above How my father set before me Still no wise about the days that lay ahead Hands and feet are free But shed come back in front of me Just the possibility of a better life instead Maybe if you give me time just to let me tell my story Tell how I came to be in the land of hope and glory Whoops. Not sure what happened there. Let's try and see if we can get it. Whoops, bit of a technical in uh, at the end of this year. It's called Decolonizing Contemporary Gospel Music. It's published by um, Bloomsbury. Uh, so thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Beckford. I think uh, uh, we, the, op the floor is open now. I think everybody, people want to, to ask questions. So if you want to ask your questions, I'll ask you to, Either, either write in the chat or you can just raise your hand and then we will uh, allow you to, to speak. Any questions from, from the audience? Oh, a question has come in already from Abiodun and uh, he asks that I would like to hear more about uh, colonial Christianity and biopolitics uh, from Professor Bedford. Uh, and uh, that's just the question he, he asked. That's to Professor Bedford. Sure. So, sure, two quick things. Um, my argument is that if you read the soteriology within colonial preaching and teaching in the Caribbean, salvation is reduced to piety. Salvation from sins is about individual salvation and transformation. There's no engagement with structural sin, the sin of the system, slavery, the brutality, because that would then encourage enslaved people to think critically, theologically, about the uh, enslavement and later colonialism. And I use Foucault's biopolitics because it has origins in the notion of the control of the body, the state's control of the body. So theological biopolitics is the way in which theological ideas police the black body, so that the black body is Salvation is fundamentally about control of the individual body. We've got nothing to do with socio-political, religious, cultural issues. And as a consequence of that, it means that Christian, the Christian imagination is limited to individual pursuits of holiness rather than collective struggle against injustice. And I would argue that colonial, colonial Christian biopolitics is still a feature of West African Christianity, both continental and diasporic, and the same with African-Caribbean Christianity, both continental and diasporic. And that's why we have decolonizing it. The Christian tradition is about decolonizing the uh, biopolitics of colonial Christianity. Thank you so much. And uh, there's a general question that I caught across to uh, two of our four speakers, which has to do with the, with the, with the query concerning whose duty to decolonize uh, Christianity in Africa. Who is, is it the academia? Is it the, the, the clery, clergy or the people themselves? Thank you. I don't know whether Father uh, will. Okay, yeah. Okay, I can go first. Uh, who, who is to decolonize? I think an exercise of this nature we are carrying out is a, a part of the process of waking people up and making them realize that something has gone wrong. A whole lot of people, even uh, theologians, may not just be aware of this, or they may be aware of it and feel too weak to want to do anything. Actually, a friend of mine saw uh, the invitation you posted, uh, I think on Facebook, and then contacted me and said, what are you thinking about? I said, about what? You are talking about decolonizing theology. I say, yes, I want to talk about it because there is a lot to talk about. You know, my conclusion about this is that uh, 
no matter whatever anybody does, I think the individual himself or herself will play a very big role in decolonizing theology. First, the mindset, the mind, the mindset has to be decolonized. Uh, without that, nothing goes nowhere. Thank you. Um, you okay? Yes, thank you, Father, for that. Yes, I agree. I think that um, we all are in this together. You, you know, we can all decolonize in our own ways, artists, um, lay people, professors, all of us. And actually, I want to show you a picture. So I bought this picture. I was very broke when I was a college student and I bought this. That was the first time, and it was in America, that I saw a black man as God. But this also actually connected me to a lot of black men. In fact, I mentioned Dr. Beckford. At one time, Dr. Beckford looked like this. So when I was reading theology, and I was like, who oh, this looks, and then I met other black men that look like this, but this is Jesus. I bought it for $10 from Rastafarians about 20 years ago when I came to the United States as a student. And that is when I started. So an artist actually influenced my theology. And I started thinking about this. When I went to Duke University for my first master's to get, uh, I wanted to be a pastor. While I was at Duke, what we were being taught, I didn't enjoy it, I wasn't feeling it. So I decided that something is off somewhere. So I decided to start reading scholars from all over, that are any scholar I could grab. And that is, um, and then I decided to go get my, my master's of theology and hence now I'm doing my PhD because of a, a role of this, an, an artist plays a role, played a role in my decolonizing. Of course my parents too, but we don't, I don't want to uh, get into that. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question in the chat. We'll take that after Dr. Jim Paris uh, raises concern. So Dr. Jim, uh, I'm back to you to unmute yourself. Uh, please pose your questions to the panelists. Yeah, I've enjoyed um, all of the uh, presentations for sure. Um, I think there's a, I think there's a missing thought, or that that's that's implied in everybody's presentations here today, but it, is, but it has to be stressed because, because we're, 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 we're talking about decolonizing Christianity when in fact, my researches into African cultures, art, philosophy, um, uh, and religion would suggest to me that the point is not to decolonize Christianity. The, 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 the Africa has the knowledge, knowledge and resources um, to, in fact, improve Christianity, transcend it, make it more sophisticated, just explode it um, to, to have a new, something that, uh, that really replaces it, um, go beyond it. Um, that, 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 that everything, I think the assumption is that everything in everything that, 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 that the colonial era has left us with is sufficient, is, is, is sufficient uh, for to, 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 to reconstruct, reconstruct to, re, to reconstruct or to, to, to find the new. When in fact, um, and Yok and Yok, Yok, Yok Niam in, kind of again intimated this that, that, that there's so much knowledge that still exists in Africa. You could, when you talk to, if you seriously interview, seriously interview uh, traditional healers and diviners and, and Africans, priests, you will discover a depth of understanding, a depth of emotion, a depth of knowledge, a depth of spirituality, which I consider the, the world it does had has had that has not really tasted because of the process of, of uh, colonialism. So in fact, to, to decolonize Christianity, I think is actually a poor a poor ambition. That the potential from Africa is 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 vastly greater. Uh, okay, and uh, I think uh, that remark would be followed because I know almost all the speakers can address that. Uh, we just join that with some questions too from the chats and then we take another round. So someone asked, uh, uh, that's the uh, Gasky, Tony asked, uh, can someone please speak to the importance of Kemet and Mat within African spirituality? And uh, there's also a, a comment from Stephen uh, Orlandi 
uh, who talks about somebody I think will probably, uh, probably Paul Crook said that he had looked at the log of the ships transporting people across uh, the middle passage. And he said some of their names listed suggested both Christian and Judaic faith. So he said he's interested in knowing about the Coptic church and its role in things. And then we, after the speakers have responded, we take out some, someone raising up the hand. So thanks, Professor Deb Buckford. All right, okay. Um, I would respond to Jim's question in two ways. I would say, I think that that's happening implicitly anyway, because I think any holistic approach to deconstruction is also about reconstruction. Uh, I wrote a book 10 years ago called Jesus Dub, which was using reggae music's um, production techniques as a way of interpret, as, as an interpretive tool. So I think just by taking apart one has a moral obligation to then reconstruct it. And whenever you reconstruct a new track in reggae dub, you're always adding some of your own stuff anyway. You know, that's why you get King Toby mix or whoever's mix. So that's happening implicitly in black liberation theology, womanist theology anyway. There is, it takes, it's a, it's a, it's a point of departure from the Christian tradition because it's bringing in new um, elements into the mix of, um, of, of what constitutes the sources of Christianity. So I think it's happening anyway. So, but we're stuck sometimes, I hear what you're saying, and I think we're stuck sometimes with the language and the concepts, and the concepts can kind of imply that we're being static when we're not. And I think a good way, the second thing I'll say just very quickly, a good way to know that we're not being static is because what we create is often not considered real Christianity. You see, because we've moved away so much from what was colonial uh, mainstream Christian scholars often say, is that really Christian? You see, so we're doing that work implicitly. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, and then Father and uh, uh, Joachim, anyone can come in to some of the questions concerning the Coptic church and the, the, the sheep of uh, transatlantic slave and the issue of uh, uh, Christian names and, uh, and all this. Yeah, I wanted Thank to say you. that uh, I wanted to say that, uh, yes, especially to Jim, and then I'll add, I'll add briefly to other um, questions. Um, I think Africans, we're already doing that. An example, so that it's not as, as though Africans are not doing it already. So if you look at, there's a church in Nigeria, I think it's in, um, it's one of the, the, the African independent churches. So there was a woman, in fact, it, it became a big news. She started incan doing incantation. So incantation is something you do within African spirituality, but she is also Christian. What they did to her is they, you know, they, the claim is all oh, your, you know, bringing fetish fetishism in the church. So she was attacked and, 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 and hurt uh, because of that. So there's, I mean, so there's this also, uh, so Africans are doing this already. They're deconstructing without even saying it. So theologian scholars, we use different, you know, all this language, fancy language, but it's already been done. But part of it is because we Africans are decolonizing from the Eurocentric version of Christianity, which is quite popular. So then it's seen as the other. It's not, it's seen as inferior. So when we're doing it, we are getting attacks. So sometimes you even use language that is familiar to, uh, to, to the mainstream Christianity, but it's happening on the continent and the continent Christianity is dying out in the West and it's growing in the global South or the majority world. And I think Africans are going to one day say, especially Africans that practice this 15th century version of Christianity that this is how we're doing it and this is how we're gonna do it. So you can have much say to this. And it's happening anyway, it, as it relates to, to homosexuality, transgender politics these days. I don't want to get into that. And it relates to actually ancient Kemet. Someone asked about Kemet. That will be actually, you can look at early Christian, early Christianity, the history of early Christianity. There is there are there are um, um, influences, of course, because Christianity came to Africa via Egypt. And then it traveled Ethiopia and then Kush, which is Sudan. So even some of the spirituality, the way they practice, they may not acknowledge it. But indigenous spirituality, which came from Kemet, right? You will be the Osiris and others, influenced how Christian, how African, early African Christians even um, uh, debate on the issue of Trinity. So, for example, some of us Afrocentric Christians wear the Ankh. Part of it is to honor that past. 
While for some Christians, they may see it as, you know, you're bringing in satanic, you know, yeah. elements into the church. Yeah, thank you so much. Father, please come in with your response. You are muted. You are muted. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was saying that the slave traders, they, they were Christians. They were Christians who were capturing anybody, whether Christians or not. Of course, in the West Coast of Africa, there will have been Muslims. There were also Christians who were taken as slaves to the uh, South America and everywhere they were taken. I was reading sometime that uh, the Pope had to intervene at one time, calling his Christians to order and saying, once somebody was baptized, if you discover that the person has been baptized, if you set him free, because that person is free indeed in Christ. Uh, that was Pope Eugene the Fourth, and that was in 1435. But uh, of course, you know that commerce is greater than faith in most of the instances. And so, what they were looking for was money and for wealth and fame. So they wouldn't yield to any advice whether it came from the Pope or not. Uh, Union has talked about the Coptic Christians, and I think it's the same thing I would have said about them. Thank you very much. Um, it's participant uh, Paul Oreime uh, as a question. Please go ahead. You, you can unmute yourself. You are muted. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, speaking from Cairo, Egypt. Um, thank you all for the beautiful discussion. Um, just two things I want to bring here um, raise concerning some of the concerns that were raised. Um, First, I remember in my philosophy days, I read M. Kwasi Wiridu, who spoke about conceptual decolonization. And I see this whole discussion in that light. It is really, really interesting to understand that there's the need to look inward. Is there anything that Africa has to offer? And like everyone has said here, a lot, a lot we have to offer. However, I do not see it as um, a project where uh, we say everything about Christianity as imported is wrong. Yeah, there were structural um, um, imbalances in the message. However, I think the project should be looking at what we have as Africans, our own conceptions of spirituality and what we have adopted as Christianity from um, the colonial project and everything. How can we add, how can we define terms based on our own worldview. Because right now, what I think is going on is that we largely want to always um, put Western standard as the standard for what should be right. But the question is, does it uh, go contrary to my own worldview or is that my worldview though different in expression still speaks of the same message? Are there places where we could bridge those gaps? Are there things we have to let go I think these are questions we should ask rather than just putting, um, because it, 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 the spirit I feel is that often when we speak about decolonization, it's more like the other, you did this. Um, we're always very um, um, vindictive. Maybe that's not the word, but it seems to be this other person is the enemy and the red likes. I think faith, hope, truth, which is a fundamental project of every religion to know God, is and should be the guiding word. So that should be our pursuit. Concerning the Coptic church, um, sorry for taking your time. The Coptic church, I live here in Egypt, Cairo. It is a very rich church, very, um, has a very deep tradition. And yeah, they sent missionaries all the way to Ethiopia, to Sudan. However, there seem to be a problem presently. The Coptic church is very small. It is dying because it seems to be enclosed to itself. And I think it's also about the idea of um, um, being open to other, other um, faiths you come across. Um, should we close ourselves as Africans and say, well, um, everything about decolonization seems to have a problem. So let's mm -hmm. close it up and build our own identity of what Christianity should be. Or should we be able to open up our, our own borders and be able to dialogue and bring out those qualities that we have to enrich the faith mm -hmm. to make it better? Thank, Thank you. you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, I will allow the speakers to address the comments 
but I just want uh, two uh, participants who have their hands up uh, to raise their questions and make it very brief so that the speakers will now take uh, across uh, any of the comments or questions that they will speak to. Uh, please, uh, I have um, uh, Dr. Jim first, and then we have Dr. Shabazz. Uh, Dr. Jim, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Augustine. I, in fact, I, I have, I have, I have nothing, nothing now. It was the I would prefer to hear the closing responses. <clears throat> okay, and uh, uh, so you, and uh, Dr. Shabazz, you have your hand up. Uh, could you please um, unmute yourself uh, so that you raise the concern? Peace. Can you guys hear me? Y yeah, we can. Okay, thank you for the presentations. Um, I, I didn't hear anything specifically about about um, about the USA, so I just wanted to invoke them uh, briefly. I wanted to mention Phyllis Wheatley, who uh, who came from um, was kidnapped in Senegal. Well, her name we know her as Phyllis Wheatley. We don't know her African name, um, but she was uh, kidnapped in Senegal and enslaved in the U.S. And she was the first um, black poet published in the United States. And she was enslaved here. And uh, basically, her poetry is sort of um, uh, uh, acknowledging that Christianity, acknowledging in quotes, Christianity saved her from pagan Africa. And now there, is all, there are also some scholars. So this speaks to the brainwashing or, or how Christianity is weaponized by Europeans. But there are scholars who say that she was being sort of a trickster in the HU tradition. I'm not very convinced by their argument, but you guys can check it out. I also wanted to mention David Walker, who was a black abolitionist based in Boston. And he wrote a book that you can read online called David Walker's Appeal, uh, published in 1829. And David Walker is calling out the hypocrisy of, of white Christians. And he says in his text that, that, um, that it's, no, it's, no, it's as normal to kill your oppressor as it is to drink water. And so he's, he's encouraging black people to rise up against the, the slave master. He also says something very provocative about, about, about inter, uh, interracial marriages. He says that a black man who marries a white woman deserves to be treated as he surely will be treated. Um, and that is like a slave. And so that's all that to say is that you had, you know, Africans early on in the United States um, challenging um, uh, uh, Europeans and European Christianity and, and, and invoking uh, the idea that Africans have a right to resist that, even if even, even as they claim the Christian tradition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, perspective uh, from the, and uh, part of the issue you raised before uh, the, the uh, speakers uh, speak, has to do with the question that uh, Caswell to Muka, Tamuka uh, raised also in the, in the, in the chat. Uh, he has, to what extent is the gospel of prosperity among many African churches and scandalous self enrichment of black African pastors, removing the idea of the gospel message and idea of Christianity? And the, 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 I have the same question in mind because it's like the damage has been done by colonialism, slavery, but it's like our people have taken it up and exploiting the people and all sorts of things we see. So the question now is uh, the tool seems to be available for everyone for oppression. So I, I think our speakers uh, take uh, the respond to that. Uh, so I start in the order of the presentation as we, we that will be the roundup session for, for, for the questions and answers. Yo uh, um, um, please. Yeah, thank you for all, for all of your great questions and remarks. Just real quick, the person that spoke from Egypt, actually Africans, it's not as though we're um, trying to be, uh, to, um, we're, we're, we're trying to be victims or you know putting ourselves in that position. But what we're doing is we're part of deconstructing is that we're saying there's a problem and we're trying to deal with the problem. And not only that, when I mentioned the early Christianity, Africans contribute us greatly to African Christianity. It's, there's no, no doubt about this. No serious scholar would say otherwise, okay? But the, the version of Christianity that we have, which is dominant here, with, even with respect to prosperity gospel, it's, um, we have to deal with that right now. And we, part of it is also, it's being also, uh, 
um, it also has been practiced in the West. So now it's being imported to Africa and then Africans have taken it, some Africans have taken it and use it in, uh, to, to sometimes dehumanize African people. Okay, so uh, that's, and then as it relates to the United States, that's definitely, we did not mention the United States, but sometimes I think the United States experience is so dominant in the conversation. But, uh, but I also saw when Dr. Beckford was making, uh, give, giving his presentation, there's so many similarities between African-American Christianity with Jamaican Christianity, and also the experience of enslaved Africans in, in, in the United States and in, in, in Jamaica, for, in, for example, how the, um, Africa, uh, how uh, Black people, uh, Christianity was imposed, and then Black people took this Christianity and turned it into something else. Hence, for example, um, even later on, Black theology came into existence as a way to deconstruct. Thank you so much, um, Father Patrick. Yeah, earlier on in my presentation, I said something about not reacting in a negative way towards something that is already negative. So one of the reasons why I chose not to talk about black spirituality, uh, because I think before the Europeans came to Africa, did we call ourselves black? I don't think so. We only saw ourselves as, as human beings. The brand of Christianity they brought was too, too straight and too dull for the African people. There was no spontaneity. There was no social, socialization. It was you know, too uh, tailored towards a particular endpoint. That gave birth to African uh, white garment churches, you know, who bring a little from here, a little from there, marry them together. The Pentecostal movement was, you know, going to bridge the gap between everything and bring the spirit-filled Christianity. But uh, I think most of what they do now is to capitalize on what the Europeans didn't take cognizance of. The Africans got needs that are to be satisfied, needs relating to life, everyday issues, poverty, sickness, security. So you want to tell them about how to get to Jesus and how Jesus will take them to, to heaven. You have to talk about prosperity here on earth. And unfortunately so, they capitalize on that and rip people off. They're going to the extreme of it. What they present to people is not Christianity. I dare to say that. Because Christianity is meant to be, you know, your relationship with your God based on who you are as Africans, creating an authentic spirituality. This incarnation of the word of God is in us already, like Dr. Beckford brought that to the fore. Christianity itself is incarnational. So if it comes to my people, are they able to let it get incarnated into their lives in order that they may be able to make some good out of it that will benefit not only themselves, but benefit the entire human race? I want to thank all those who have participated at this conference. Thanks particularly to the organizers. Thank you so much. And Prof, and I send a question to in the chat. Can sure, you sure. Sure, yeah, three, the, just the three questions really, response to three questions really quickly. Um, the first thing that the uh, brother from Egypt who was, was talking about animosity. I want to, I push the boat out even further on this in my research. My argument is that the way in which enslaved people in the Caribbean understood Christianity was that it was the occult. It, it was wickedness. And they left us traces of their understanding of Christianity that, uh, in, in language, in also images and metaphors that they, they left us. There, there's a lot of imagery in slave language, images of consumption, there are even words that enslaved Africans invented in Jamaica to give us a sense of slavery as a form of devouring, eating them out. You know, um, uh, uh, the whole idea of cannibalism takes shape with the advent of slavery. It's one of the ways in which enslaved people describe their predicament. It was like being completely devoured, a village disappearing overnight, the working people to death. It's a devouring. So for me, I don't think it's about animosity. It's trying to reflect what the literature suggests, what the, the, the material suggests took place in the Caribbean case. 
you know so i think it's it's it needs to be it isn't about how we're perceiving it it's what the evidence suggests about how people thought so i i'm not feeling uh, uh emotional about it in that sense i'm just dealing with what my ancestors were trying to leave behind and reconfigure for us to understand how they were feeling and if they understood christianity as a cult as a demonic force uh, something to take seriously uh in terms of rethinking then how they reconstructed their faith and that just leads to another point some scholars argue that what we have in black christianity is an african base interpreting christianity so in many respects what we had for many decades was that centuries was never considered christian enough because it was it was african it was an african interpretation first thing i think that what the american uh brother shabazz said is really important uh, there is a long history of dialogue in the 18th 19th 20th century amongst um, african americans caribbean people people uh, black folk in europe um, addressing issues of faith and spirituality and sharing these stories work of courtright davis is quite significant because he talks in his book plantation church about the faith in the southern part of the americas the caribbean going up in terms of uh, to north america in terms of um, black experience so that dialogue is, is is really important think of garveyism as well as another transatlantic um, dialogue around issues of, of religion. religion. Uh, Malcolm X's mother was a Caribbean person as well, as you, you were, uh, um, Nation of Islam, as other uh, famous Caribbean people as well. So this dialogue it, is there within the history. Um, and the, the third thing is regarding prosperity doctrine, look, we know it's false prophecy. You know, um, the whole idea that you can reduce faith to a monetary value is not, is not, uh, it's not Christian, um, it's not in the biblical text. Um, but I understand it in a failed state where there's no health care, where there is no provision for schooling, then people are going to be looking to the church to provide resources. And if the church doesn't have the resources, sometimes it has to come up with a, a system for giving people hope. So I understand why it's flourished in particular places and flourished because of the new American imperialism in terms of televangelism and the, the neoliberalization of Christianity that gets exported. Uh, around the world from televangelists in North America. So I understand it in, in that sense, but we know it's a, a corruption of the faith and deeply problematic wherever it manifests itself. Thank you so much, Professor Bedford. Uh, thank you, uh, very Reverend Father Patrick, and thank you, Yokem, uh, uh, the Bali, as well as all the uh, all, uh, participants and those who have raised comments and and um, and also of concern and the, co the conversation continues but i hand over to the host to to do the rest uh, as we end the session mukile please okay thank you very much augustine uh, that was a wonderful uh, thank you to all again to the all participants and we really appreciate you taking time off your busy schedule to be with us today just a quick uh, uh um an announce quick announcement really so we we have some events, you know, um, you know, some of them we do it related to independence of African countries, and we have one uh, tomorrow about Zimbabwe. So we have, uh, feel free to join us. Uh, it will be telling us about uh, the land reforms, everything about Zimbabwe, and anyone who's interested um, to speak about the country of the, the the independence, you know, on the day of independence of any African countries, feel free to. To, um, to write to us and we, we, we love to, to have you. And also this is just a list, quick list of uh, different events we have every month. We do our webly, so our monthly webinars, as you can see, we have a few there. And um, yeah, that, that will be in August. We have uh, this um, uh, also. So uh, all, all of this we can see that in our website, on our website. Uh, so feel free to join us. And also you can help us in any way you can, whether it's uh, by, uh, uh, volunteering or or mentoring some of our members because remember we have different uh, different um, uh, people you know we have uh, in, in the network also uh, please subscribe we have a LinkedIn um, group where we're on Facebook we have also a WhatsApp group but this uh, after you you join us we can give the link to to join the WhatsApp group and on Twitter okay so that's it uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, being here today, uh, we will love you, seeing you, and all. Uh, especially, take, should big thank to our guests today and to all participants. So, uh, we should have a nice weekend to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.